Collections at the memorial that continually intrigue me are those that tell the stories of the prisoners of war. I was recently looking through a diary and instantly I was grabbed. It was redolent of art school days. It was full of drawings, photographs, thoughts, captions, press clippings, recipes, books. I wondered, who did this diary belong to? On the first page, in bold capital letters, it says, 13 June, 1944, shot down. The next page, there's a press clipping, and it says, this sketch of Light Lieutenant Carmody was drawn on an odd piece of paper by Gilbert Docking, peacetime artist. Both Carmody and Docking were prisoners of war in a German camp. I needed to do a bit more research on Gil Docking. I wanted to find out who he was. So in 1935, he graduated from Melbourne Boys High. He won a scholarship to attend the Royal Melbourne Technical Art School. From there, his first role was as a graphic designer for a shower screen company. It wasn't actually quite the um, creative opportunity that he was anticipating. Now around this kind of time, his family, who were very strong Methodists, were becoming increasingly alarmed by the reports of Nazi activity. So Gill, who was a very strong Methodist and very much saw that organisation as a group striving for social justice against corruption, decided that he would leave his role as a graphic designer and he studied to become a pastor. Gill increasingly found that his lectures on peace couldn't compete with the imminent threat of war on Australian soil, so he enlisted. This is October 1942. He became Flight Lieutenant Gil Docking. He was posted with the 455th Squadron. He flew a bow fighter with Keith Carmody across the English Channel. Now on the 13th of June 1944, they were shot down. They ended up for 24 hours floating in a dinghy in the North Sea. And at that point, they were picked up by a German motor torpedo boat and they were interned in the German prisoner of war camp Stalag Luft 3A, which is about 30 miles south of Berlin. Gill and Keith Carmody spent the rest of the war as interns at this prisoner of war camp. Gill Docking's experience of this that he records in his diary is so highly visual. So his text is illustrated by very fine drawings. He creates relief by drawing comics. He has inserted a lot of photographs with personal captions that contextualise for him what was going on. One of the last remarks that Gill makes in his diary is about the liberation, about being liberated by the Russians. And he says, at last we could hear the rumble of the cannons of the Russian Red Army tank as they rapidly advanced. They made contact with us, they clapped, they danced, and then they took off 30 miles south to Berlin. After the war, Gill returned to the art world. He won a position as education officer for the National Gallery of Victoria. He travelled regional Victoria with exhibitions. He went to 50 towns with a travelling show. The success of these exhibitions actually meant the establishment of regional galleries in Victoria. The success also precipitated an invitation for Gill to establish the Art Gallery of Newcastle and to direct that art gallery as well, which he did for seven years. And during that time, he was to identify the young Brett Whiteley as an emerging artist. He acquired Brett Whiteley's first ever purchased work, which was called Autumn Abstract. By the time Gil Docking left the Newcastle Art Gallery, it was Australia's leading provincial art gallery. He went to Sydney and he became assistant director of the New South Wales Art Gallery. In 1982 he retired and he dedicated himself to curating the works of his wife who was an artist. Her name was Sheila or known as Shay Lawson. In 2014 Gill was awarded the medal for the Order of Australia for Services to the Arts in 
2015, a year later, on the 17th of November, he died and he was sitting in his favourite chair in Paddington. He had a cup of tea beside him. His favourite biscuit, was, which was a ginger nut. All the dishes were done. It was very peaceful. The Prisoner of War Diary, kept by Gil Docking, foreshadowed what was to become an extraordinary post-war service to the arts in Australia.